So we move now into building LFS cross toolchain and temporary tools. Go to the introduction, some important preliminary material. So it's saying that it's divided into three stages at this point, a cross compiler and its associated libraries. Then we'll be using this toolchain to build some utilities that helps isolate them from the host distribution. And third, we enter a true environment, which obviously helps them further uh, improve that isolation from the host to build the remaining tools that are required for the final system. And yeah, really important. This is where the real work of building the new system begins. Be very careful to follow the instructions exactly as the book shows them. You should try to understand what each command does and no matter how eager you are to finish your build, you should refrain from blindly typing the commands as shown. Read the documentation when there is something you do not understand. So really let's just say reread the documentation because as I said before, I would recommend reading the whole of the book at least once and then maybe going back and read reading bits that were a bit complicated or something you didn't understand. Um, and then when you're actually doing the commands now, reread the documentation when there's something you do not understand. Also keep track of your typing and the output of commands by using the T utility. So it could be useful. Maybe you could use a screen recorder such as I'm using to keep a log of what you're doing. Or like I say, I record everything from beginning to end to prove that I'm not doing anything magical in the background to get things to work. Everything you see is um, everything th that can be done to create a successful output. So you can use my videos as a reference as well. And as it says, it makes debugging easier if something goes wrong to find out, you know, maybe you missed a, a letter or a command or a carriage return even sometimes. The next section is technical introduction to build process while following one presents very important general instructions. So I won't go through this. It is quite technical. It might not make sense first time. I have done a video on how cross compiling works, um, particularly, well, it, in fact, it's more for cross com, a true cross compile. Um, but it does give you some indication of how this works, um, how you build several stages. Um, uh, there's a wiki page about this Canadian cross compiling. That's the process that's used. It's not truly a cr cr Canadian cross compile because that's, um, what is it? No, it's not true. I can't even remember myself. Let's look this up on the wiki. Uh, right, yes, it, it, yeah, that's right. It isn't a true Canadian cross in that we're building for the same technology. A Canadian cross is where the original machine is much slower or less convenient than the target. So the example it gives here that we've got a machine A that's running Windows XP with a 32-bit processor and we're using it to build a cross-compiler for machine B which has got macOS on a 64-bit processor and that can create executables for an Android processor. So again, it's quite complica complicated and quite hard for you to get your head around but the difference is and the reason why I say it's not a true Canadian cross is that all the architectures in these three stages is the same in Linux from scratch. That's the only difference. They're using the cross compiling and in particular the Canadian cross compiling to segregate the host system from the final LFS system to separate them um, and make it less likely that at each stage there's reliance on the previous stage or ultimately the host system. So that's what that page is about. Like I say, it's quite complex, especially if you've never come across cross compiling before. Um, but if you read that a few times and so read the wiki page, it can give you some understanding as, as to what's happening. Um, so these are important compilation instructions. Um, I'll go through this in case there's anything new to me, but generally I'll be pointing out anything to be careful of through my experience. I've I've um, gained compiling LFS over the years. 
So it starts off with a caution. During the development cycle of LFS, the instructions in the book are often modified to adapt for a package update or take advantage of new features from updated packages. Mixing up the instructions in different versions of the book can be can cause subtle breakages. This kind of issue is generally result from reusing some script created from a prior release of LFS. Such reuse is strongly discouraged. If you're reusing scripts from a prior LFS release for any reason, you need to be very careful to update the scripts to match the current version of the LFS book. So clearly they've had people who've created scripts to maybe automate this and they're just reusing them for the newer versions of the packages and it doesn't quite work correctly. Um, I did have my own system for creating automated scripts, but it did rely on the book to create them so it was up to date. Um, but uh, if you want to use automation, there is um, an automated Linux Scratch project, which I've also done a video on um, if you do want to automate it, but obviously you're not going to learn barely anything by doing that. And it does help if you've got some experience with LFS to, to use the automated Linux from scratch. Um, here's some things you know about building each package. Several packages are patched before compilation, but only when the patch is needed to circumvent a problem. A patch is often needed in both the current and following chapters, but sometimes when the same package is built more than once, the patch is not needed right away. Therefore, do not be concerned if the instructions for a downloaded patch seem to be missing. And warnings about offsets or fuzzes may also be encountered, but don't worry about them. And it says about some warnings may appear on the screen during compilation. And they can be safely ignored. They're usually about deprecated, uh, but not invalid use of syntax. Um, standards often change. It's not a serious problem, but it does cause warnings to appear. And again, it says check one last time that we've got this environment variable set, which you, you will see me occasionally do it just to make sure that I'm not going to do anything untoward. And again, I would recommend that you do it. If you're ever unsure if it's set, just run it. It doesn't take more than a minute. In fact, more than five seconds to do. And it will save you a, hell, a load of grief um, by running it. Um, you know, if it's not there, you risk trashing your system and losing a lot of work, as well as your system, if it's a live system, a, a, a real live system rather than a a USB live system. Um, the build instructions assume that the host system requirements including the symbolic lens is set correctly so we have checked that already but again it's important to double check if you're unsure and it's a synopsis, synopsis of the build process. Place all the sources and patches in the directory we've got ours in the MNT LFS sources directory so let's change there now. There they are. And what we do is we change that directory for each package, you extract them. You'll see me doing this over and over again, so it'll become second nature, especially when you start doing it yourself. Use the TAR program to extract them. It says don't use copy or anything else to copy to the source code tree or anything, anything like that. You change that directory where the package was extracted follow the instructions, change back to the sources and delete it. And you do that for each one. You don't want to be using stale source code where, where it's got outputs from a previous build because those outputs might be used in the new build, but the outputs might be wrong from that previous build. The new build might actually want the outputs compiled in a different way or with different features and so on. Um, another thing I've noticed that has changed previously, these links next and previous links used to be at the bottom of the page and I always recommended to scroll to the bottom of the page and click on those links to move on. It looks like they've been removed now and that the links are only at the top. So I still recommend scrolling to the bottom of the page because um, it just ensures you haven't missed any commands that might need to be done. So move to the bottom of the page just to make sure you've read everything that you've done all the commands and then click the link at the top of the page to move on. So cross compiling a tool chain. So we're in chapter five now, we're gonna do the first bit of compiling where we compile the cross tool chain. And it says that there 
and these new programs get installed under LFS tools but the libraries are installed in their final place since they pertain to the system that we want to build. So the first package we're going to start with is bin utils so here we go we're starting with this cycle we're going to be doing over and over we're in the sources directory the first thing we do is we extract the package so Generally, you'll see in the LFS instructions that they use tar minus XF. I like to use V to get some output to make sure that um, A, I'm extracting the right package, and B, that I can see that something's actually happening rather than just sitting there with a prompt doing nothing for a while. Especially if you're on a slow disk or a slow machine, it might be, especially with some of the bigger packages, it might be up to a minute before the prompt comes back. So by using V, um, you'll see things happening if you're over a slow link you might not want to use v uh, for example for some reason you're over a serial link it might be extremely slow all the output will have to be transmitted so you might not want to use v in that case but um, if you've got time and you're not in a hurry then you might want to use v anyway so the first package is bin utils press enter and that's now extracted so next we need to change directory into bin utils Press tab to complete the name. And now we're ready. At this point, where we're inside the source directory we've just extracted. We're ready to start building by following the instructions. And it says it is important that bin utils be the first package compiled because both, both glibc and GCC perform various tests on the available linker and assembler to determine which of their own features to enable. So before I do anything else, I'm going to once more do echo .lfs to make sure that that's set. It is. So I'm now, pardon me, going to copy and paste each of these commands. So we've made a temporary build directory as recommended by the documentation. And we've changed into that directory. And next bit, it says here we can time the next three commands to see how long it takes for a bass unit i tend not to bother doing this now um, the bit that takes most time is the make the configure normally only takes about 30 seconds anyway especially on a faster machine but you might want to do what it says here in fact i'll, I'll demonstrate it but generally i would run each command in separately and I may just time the make command if that's going to be the longest part, if it's a big package, for example, GCC. So we need to do time, open curly bracket, you've got to put a space in, paste in the first configure command, put a space in, double ampersand, another space, scroll down to the next command. Oh, you see all the explanations for the options that are being passed to configure. So it's worth reading, especially if you are keen on learning exactly what's going on. Then we paste in the next command, space, double ampersand, space, and the final command. So this, all in one go, before we get the prompt back, will compile, uh, configure the package, it will compile the package with make, and it will install the package with the make install command, all in one go. So I'll just terminate that with a semicolon, and put in a close bracket, close curly bracket, as you can see here. And at the end of that, we'll get a time, and that'll be an SBU, which we can use as a rough guide for how long some of the future packages are going to take. So there it is. It's... Uh, Configuring possibly still, yeah, now it's compiling. While that's running, I'll just get up another tab and just do a top. And you can see there's multiple jobs running there. These ones with CC, CC1 against them. It's now dropped down, back down to one job. But it shows that uh, multiple jobs are running. If I do Z to make it a nice red color and press 1, it will show how busy each individual core is. You can see they're all being used and it totals more than 100%. So that shows that um, that make, uh, make flags, was it, is being used. And you can see it's finished while I've been on that tab. 
Um, so that's taken a total of 36 and a half seconds. So my SBU I'll make a note of is 36.5 seconds. In fact, if I was to round that down, it would probably be 36, but 36.5 will do. So that's bin utils done. There's nothing else to be done. All we need to do is return to the sources directory and remove the source directory for bin utils. And we can move on. As I say, um, I've scrolled to the bottom of the page here. There's nothing else to do, but they've removed the links at the bottom now. So I've got to use the links at the top. And we're now going to compile GCC. So this is one of the bigger packages. It's the one that takes the longest to compile. And we have to compile it three times, I believe. So this is where a lot of the time is taken. So extract GCC 13.2. It's finished extracting the change into the directory. And then we can start reading the instructions in the book. And it says GCC requires GMP, MPFR and MPC. As these packages may not be included in your host distribution, they were built using GCC. Unpack each package into the GCC source directory and rename the resulting directory so that GCC build procedures will automatically use them. And there's frequent misunderstandings about what to do here, but you'll see me do it, so hopefully that will help. Um, now, Gen 2 probably has got these packages available, um, but despite that, or well, that one isn't, um, we're still going to extract. No, they're not available. I thought they might have been. Um, even if they were, I'd still recommend extracting them and building them as they are here because you're following the instructions to the letter. You're removing the possibility of something not going quite right and therefore having a failure and not being able to complete the build successfully. So just do everything as the book says. So as you can see, we're extracting each of these tar files and then they're being renamed to an unversion directory, which is what GCC will be using when it's being compiled. So on x8664 host, set the default directory name for 64 bit libraries to lib. So again, if you want to 32 bit, run this anyway, just to be sure. It won't do anything, but at least you've not missed something and put that doubt in your mind. Should I have run that or shouldn't I have run that? So that has done something there's no output so we've not got any output even on the 64-bit machine uh, and again that's why it's a good idea to run it anyway because although i said before there's generally an output and if you see an output you know it's run and done something in this case there isn't any output it's just done a set command which is to modify a file um, and in the case where it has done the modification it has actually hasn't uh, done anything and I can prove that it's done something because if I list that file you can see it's updated the date and time to March 31st 1226 where well, it's just turned 1227 now so you can see that file has actually been updated next thing we've got to do is create a temporary build directory and we change into that build directory and now we're going to prepare the build for compilation by running the configure with all these options and once again all these options are explained it tells you what they do and as you can see that configure didn't take more than 10 seconds maybe so the make command is going to be the bulk of the time so we'll run that and you can see it started building i'll just go to this top to see that yeah all the cores are being used again so i'm pretty confident that that make flags is being used and I can also hear the fan coming on uh, showing that the CPU is actually doing some hard work so um, I can't remember how long this bit actually takes probably 10 minutes 15 minutes not too long at this stage and I'll come back when it's complete
Okay, well that was a lot quicker than I thought it would take. It's only 4 minutes 25 seconds, 26 seconds to build. So that's pretty nippy. Um, so now we're going to install the package with this command. Send a click, paste that in. Um, what happens here now? Build has installed a couple of internal system headers. Normally, one of them limits dot h would in turn include the corresponding system limit limits dot h header. In this case, LFS user include limits dot h. However, at the time of this build of GCC, LFS user include limits h does not exist. So the internal header that has just been installed in is a partial self-contained file and does not include the extended features of the system header. This is adequate for building glibc, but the full internal header will be needed later. Create a full version of the internal header using a command that is identical to what the GCC build system does in normal circumstances. And there's a note about the command. It says, the command below shows an example of nested command substitution using two methods, back quotes and a dollar brackets construct. It could be written using the same method of both substitutions, but it's shown this way to demonstrate how they can be mixed. Generally, the dollar bracket method is preferred. Yeah, this um, there's issues with uh, back ticks. Um, sometimes they're hard to get to on certain keyboards. Uh, may not be mapped correctly or may not even have the key to access that character. They're also hard to see. They're hard to distinguish. They might be mistaken for an ordinary apostrophe rather than uh, uh, the back tick as they are. Um, a normal apostrophe is normally a forward tick if there is any discrimination between the two. So that's the first back tick and the wrapping back tick is that one there. And the nested um, construct they're talking about is this dollar open bracket here and that's the closing bracket there which is the preferred one. It's a bit more obvious as to what it does um, and definitely more preferable uh, than the, the back tick method. But like it says, it's a, an educational thing, the reason why they've done it like this. And it is good to see uh, both the older, more error prone way and the newer, uh, easy to read way. Uh, certainly less error prone. So this is one single command. It's been split over two lines because of that backslash there. So we've done the CD to go back to the root of the GCC source. We can now paste this command in and it's written that file as it says in the way that GCC would do it. So that's the end of GCC. I can't scroll anymore. I'm at the bottom. Let's come back out of that and tidy up by removing that directory and move on to the Linux 674 API headers. So let's extract that Linux. and change into it. So the first thing we do is make sure there's no stale files embedded in the package. So this is recommended to run this. Now extract the user visible kernel headers from source. The recommended make target cannot be used, which is called headers installed because it requires rsync, which may not be available. The headers are placed first in user, then copied to the needed location. So make headers. Then it looks like we delete some files that are not required. And then we copy the remaining files that we do need into the final location. And that's all we need for the moment with Linux. So we'll tidy that up by removing it. And move on to glibc. So let's now extract glibc. Change into it. So this, it says it's going to, I didn't see how long GCC was going to take, but anyway, uh, glibc, it says it's going to take one and a half SBUs. So that in theory is about um, 45 seconds because an SBU for me took 36 seconds, where it's probably actually about 50, 55 seconds. 
Um, so we'll see how accurate this one is. So the GDPC is extracted. I've changed it into directory. First of all, we need to create a symbolic link for LSB compliance. And additionally for 64-bit, create a compatibility symbolic link. So this does need to be done for both architectures, 32-bit and 64-bit. Let's paste that in. And you can see it has actually output something here, show that it's done something. And it says the above command correct is correct. The LN command has several syntactic versions, so be sure to check info core utils before reporting what may appear to be an error. So, um, yeah, there's obviously people have had issues with what's written there. So now we've got a patch to ensure the runtime data is put in an FHS compliant location. So that looks all okay. Then we once again create a temporary build directory and change into it. Then um, we have to ensure the LD config and SLN utilities are installed into user SBIN. So to do that, we put this command in and then we can run the configure command. And it says it might get a message with this warning and it's generally harmless. There's a note here about problems compiling GDBC with parallel make. Now I must admit I've not had a problem with GDBC compiling in parallel for many, many years. I vaguely remember having problems years and years ago and I'm talking like you know, maybe 15 years ago. Um, but in any case, if you do get problems, in fact, with any package you suspect it might be to do with the fact it's being compiled in parallel, then override make with make minus J1. It'll override the default um, option of using make flag. So just put my make minus J1 there like that, if you suspect that's a problem. But generally in the LFS book, if it does need for certain, does need to be compiled with one job, it will tell you. It will tell us to do that, so don't worry too much about it. Let's time this, see how long it does take, and execute it. And in fact, sometimes if it fails with a parallel make, you can sometimes just rerun the make command, and it will actually carry on successfully. Oh, in fact, it does say to rerun the make command, so yes. Uh, you could try just running rerun, rerunning make on its own, and if that doesn't work the first time on the first rerun, then rerun it with the minus J1. Okay, well, you can see that took a little bit longer than expected. It was, for me, more than one and a half SBUs. Uh, more like two and a bit, maybe. Um, so that's built successfully anyway. We've got a warning here. If LFS is not properly set, and despite recommendations you're building as root, the next command will install a newly built GLIBC to your host system, which is almost certainly render it unusable. So we're not building as root and we have got LFS checked, but let's double check. We are not root because you can see the user is LFS. We can do ID to prove that. And we can once again do LFS, belts and braces, just to double check we have got it set. So we are at liberty to install this command correctly. And in fact, it looks like this, I forgot this install takes a little while. 
so the SBU is even longer than two and a bit, it'll probably be two and a half or maybe even three. Okay, so that's done. Um, fix a hard coded path to the executable loader in the LDD script. So we need to copy this said command, put that in. At this point, it is imperative to stop and ensure that the basic functions, which are compiling and linking of the new tool chain, are working as expected. To perform a sanity check, run the following commands. So this looks like it creates a small. Uh, it looks like they've changed this. Actually, they used to create a small um, C file, and now it looks like they're piping what the contents of that C file used to be directly into GCC and then we're just reading the output which is the a.out file so let's run that and then run this readout command and you can see that the output that's expected here does match with what we've got on the screen so we should have requesting program interpreter forward slash lib64 forward slash ld linux x8664.so.2 so that's all worked successfully and it says if you're on a 30 bit machine the interpreter name will be different it will be lib stroke ld linux.so.2 and as it says if it's not shown as above or if there's no output at all then something's gone wrong so you'll have to go back and retrace your steps to find out what went wrong so we can remove that a.out file. And it says building packages in the next chapter, chapter will serve as an additional check that the tool chain has been built properly. Obviously, if you can't build, then something's wrong with what we've done so far because we've now got a tool chain which is kind of capable of compiling. If some package, especially bin utils pass two or GCC pass two fails to build, it is an indication that something's gone wrong with the preceding bin utils gcc or glibc installations well we've not had any errors everything seems to have gone all, all right so i'm not expecting anything untoward to happen <clears throat> so let's go back to sources and tidy up the glibc package we're at the bottom of the page so let's move on and we have to install lib standard cc uh, sorry lib standard c++ from gcc so we need to extract gcc Again, as it says here, Lib standard C++ is part of the GCC sources. You should unpack the GCC table, which we've done, and change into the GCC 13.2.0 directory. Again, create a separate build directory. Change into the build directory. And prepare it for compilation with this configure command. and build the package. And install it. And then there's a libtool archive file that needs to be removed, or several, which it says are harmful for the cross compilation. So let's get rid of them. And that's lib standard C done. C++. So once again, we'll go back to sources and tidy up and move on to the next section, which is cross-compiling temporary tools.